So it was about this time two years ago, it was the month of October two years ago, I was out to lunch with an individual from our church. It was just pretty standard pastoral visit lunch. They just want to talk about some things in life and how life was going for them and had a great lunch. And near the end of our lunch, the person I was meeting with put down their fork and they said, okay, I, this is going to sound a little weird and sorry to kind of just say this, but has anybody ever told you, do you have a bump on your neck? And I was like, no, do I? And he's like, yeah, I don't know if it's the way you're sitting or something, but you know, you have a bump on your neck. Now, I probably would have dismissed it but this person was a medical professional. They weren't a doctor, but in the medical world. And they said, you know, you may want to get that looked at and checked out. So we finished lunch. I get in my car. And the first thing I do is I grab my rearview mirror and I like pull it down towards my neck. And I'm like poking it and looking around. And I'm like, I don't see anything. I don't feel anything. And so I drive back to church and I'm like, I just need to get a bigger mirror. So I go into the bathroom and I'm up close. And I'm like, again, looking. I'm like, sure enough, like, yeah, there's a little thing there. What in the world is that? Now, that was on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and so we come to church on Sunday, and we're in between services. One of the great things about our church is we have more nurses and doctors and PAs than we know what to do with, because, and med students, because the hospital's right down the road. So I found a doctor in between services, and I said, hey, somebody told me that I have a bump on my neck this week. What do you think I should do about that? And he's like, well, do you mind if I take a look? I'm like, yeah, please. So right in the middle of the lobby, he sits me down. He starts like massaging my neck and poking around and feeling he's like, yep, there's a little something there. And I'm like, what should I do? He's like, you should probably get it checked out. I'm like, great. That's two people in one week who are telling me to go get this thing checked out. So he said, start with your primary care physician and then go from there. So I, I schedule an appointment for the next week. They look at it. They're like, yeah, we should probably send you to a specialist, have that looked out. Let's run some blood work. They do that. That seems fine. And so they're like, okay. So he said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do an ultrasound, and then we're going to send that to a specialist to have them read the ultrasound and look at it. Now, this is in October. And so he says, let's go ahead and set up an appointment for an ultrasound. The first appointment I could get wasn't until like middle of December, which means I've got to wait for two months to like get any sense of idea of like what's going on with my neck. And, and it's right away, like I have all this angst. I have all this concern that's starting to grow. Like I jump to worst case scenario right away. It's probably cancer. It's probably spread all throughout my body. I'm going to have to undo, endure chemo and radiation and I'll lose all my hair. <laughs> and then I'm going to die, right? Like that, my mind just goes there right away. So for two months, I'm sitting in that place. I go get the ultrasound. It's December. They kind of do it all. And what I'm anticipating is that they're going to do the ultrasound. They're going to look at the results, and then they're going to tell me what's going on. And so I go in. They're like, yep, we're going to do the ultrasound. We're not going to tell you anything because that's not our job. We then send the results to a specialist who will read them for you and tell you what's going on. So they do the exam and they said, you're going to get uh, a notification in your healthcare portal on the app. And all you have to do is once you get that notification that the results are done, that it's ready to be read, you then schedule an appointment with a specialist. So I go do that. We're in December. The first appointment I can get isn't until March. And so now I've got to wait three more months. And during that time, like all of those narratives about what's happening in my neck. And I'm just convinced every time I look in the mirror, the thing is getting bigger. It's growing. It's like developing a personality and it's trying to attack me and it's communicating to me. It's just worst case scenario all around. So they, you know, eventually I, I get into the specialist. They say, it's not that big of a deal. It probably is just a cyst. Things look good on the ultrasound, but we're going to do a biopsy on it just in case. The first time I can get in for a biopsy is May. And so by now, it's been like eight or nine months just living with like what is going on all the while trying to tell myself, don't be worried until there's something to worry about. But for, throughout whole season, there's moments and days and seasons of angst and calm, but then angst again, and then I'd have some calm, and then angst again, and everything's fine. It's just, you know, something they have to keep an eye on. I just have a big thyroid, apparently, that likes to wave at people as I'm having lunch with them. But during those months, there's just these moments and these seasons and these days of angst and concern and what if. 
and worst case scenario. And I wonder if anybody's ever been there before. You get some sort of news, you're in the middle of a health scare, you've lost your job, you see nothing but doom and gloom about the economy and you think, how am I going to provide for my family? You're in a relationship that is tense and strenuous and you just want it to be reconciled and resolved and you're wondering, is this ever going to get back together, put back together? We all have these moments where angst in our life is high. And in those moments when angst is high, the thing we want is peace. The thing we want is comfort. And the question is, where do we go to get peace when the angst is high? And maybe you're here this morning and you're in one of those seasons. You're in some sort of crisis. You're in some sort of situation. And it just feels like you wake up in the morning and the angst and the anxiety is so high it makes you stick sick to your stomach instantly. Well, in John 14, the disciples are in that place. They're in a place of angst. And what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to bring them peace and comfort. It's his final night with the disciples. They start this evening with Jesus around this meal, not knowing it's going to be their final night with him. But somewhere along the way, in the middle of the meal, he springs it upon them. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere else. And where I'm going, you can't come, and it's all starting to set in for the disciples. Wait, 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 wait. This is our last night with Jesus. What does he mean he's going away? What does he mean he's going to a place where we can't come? Why can't we come with him? So Jesus sees the angst and the concern all over their face, and what he's trying to do in John 14 in part is bring them some sense of peace. He will say, by the end of this chapter, my peace I give you my peace I leave with you. And so if Jesus is seeking to offer his peace, the question is, how do we receive it? How is it that we receive it? What is it that we have to do to receive his peace? And these are the words that Jesus says to his disciples for them to receive the peace that he's giving in the midst of their angst. This is chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. So Jesus can see the angst and the concern on their face, and the metaphor that he uses to describe where they're at is orphans. He's saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Me leaving will cause you to feel as though you've been abandoned, you've been left, but don't worry, don't fret. Their concern is that they are going to be alone without Jesus. Now, they're not really going to be alone because they have each other, but Jesus is the anchor point for this group. Jesus is the one who has brought them together. Jesus has been the common denominator in all of their lives. And if he leaves, well, what's going to happen to the rest of us? Jesus is trying to bring comfort. And what he says is that even though I will be physically absent, even though you won't see me and I won't be present with you physically, I will be with you spiritually says, even though I will be physically absent, I will be spiritually present because when I leave, I will tell my Father to send the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on where you're at in your spiritual journey, depending on the church tradition perhaps you grew up in, the concept of the Holy Spirit can seem kind of strange and kind of weird because it's like, I can't see Him. I don't hear him, but I'm supposed to. I don't really know what to do with him. And for some people, the Holy Spirit might seem like the crazy uncle of the Trinity, right? We don't really know what to do with him. It seems kind of awkward, and sometimes we avoid him at family gatherings because we just don't know how the whole thing works. But the Holy Spirit is a wildly important doctrine and belief for followers of Jesus because the Holy Spirit is how God mediates his presence to his people in the here 
and now. If you were to go back to the Old Testament, it was thought and believed that God's presence lived and dwelt in the temple. It was localized. It was in the temple. If you wanted to be able to be in God's presence, you had to travel to Jerusalem to go into the temple to sit in his presence. Even when Jesus steps in to our world, it was understood that God's presence, for those who had eyes to see, that Jesus was God with us in the flesh. God's presence was with Jesus. It was localized wherever Jesus was, God's presence was. So for a long season of time, God's presence was localized. But when the Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, God's presence is no longer localized, but it's universal. It's everywhere all the time. It lives within us. It resides within us. The Spirit connects us together so that we are one. That's what Jesus says here, verse 19. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also live, and on that day you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me, and I am in you. So one of the main purposes of the Spirit is to mediate God's presence to His people in the here and now. And there's lots of ways that that gets worked out, and there's lots of things that the Holy Spirit does as He mediates God's presence. But here Jesus is highlighting that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to be an advocate for God's people. That's what he says in verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. So in verse 16, the word advocate is describing something that the Holy Spirit does, but by the time we get to the end of this chapter in verse 26, the word advocate will be given as a title, the advocate. This is who the Spirit is, also in what he does. Now, our understanding of an advocate is usually somebody who operates as a support for somebody who maybe is in need. Somebody who doesn't have the, all the resources that they need, who doesn't have uh, the systems and structures and life that they need. A person comes alongside them and operates as an advocate, meaning if you have a passion to help refugees, you can be an advocate for a refugee as they're coming into our country to ensure that they have everything that they need, that they're set up well and they're taken care of. Or if you're somebody who has a desire to help people with disabilities, you can come alongside them and use your voice, use your influence to ensure that they and everybody else in their situation has what they need. So an advocate usually comes alongside and uses their position, their resources, and their influence to advocate, to support for another person. Now that's part of what the Spirit does. And we're told in Romans... Romans 8, verse 26, that the Spirit advocates on our behalf in prayer to the Father. This is Romans 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. It's Romans 8, 26 and 27. So the Spirit, if we're in a difficult situation, if we're in a place where angst is high and we're longing for peace and we know we should pray, but we don't know how, we don't have the words, and all we have is a groan, uh, the, the Spirit prays on our behalf to God. The Spirit advocates for us to the Father so that the Father knows everything that we need. Now, even though that's typically our image of advocacy, coming alongside somebody and communicating what they need to somebody else, this word advocate is the Greek word parakleto. And it's actually two words put together to make one word. It's the word para, which is a preposition, which means to come alongside somebody and the word kleto, which means to call out, to come alongside and to call out. So that means the image associated with this word is that the Spirit comes alongside us and calls out to us and speaks to us, encourages us, tells us to keep going, tells us it's going to be okay. 
And it's kind of the image um, for those who have ever run a race. I was at a cross-country meet of my daughters last year, or excuse me, last weekend. And at the start of the race, all the kids are excited. They're going. It's a 5K race. They're running. They're running. And the way that the course was set up, it was up in Manitowoc. You had these spots where you could see your kid run along the way through the course. And at the beginning, everybody's excited. Yeah, we're doing it. And then you go to mile one, and you go to mile two, and you can tell they're getting tired, they're getting exhausted. Well, they have that final stretch, like the last few hundred yards, and parents line this stretch of the, the course, and the face of all the runners looks like that. You can, you can see all the pain on their face. And what are parents doing? They're coming alongside their kid in that moment, and they're calling out to them, you've got it, don't stop keep going. You're almost there. They're operating as the Spirit would in our lives. Hey, you got it. Keep going. One girl's running like 200 yards away from the finish line, and you can just see the pain all over her face. She kind of stutter steps and stops and slows down, bends over, just heaves and throws up right on the course. And all the parents, even though they weren't the parents of her, everybody cheered for them. You got it. Keep going. She stood up, wipes her mouth, <laughs> and sprinted hard and fast because she knew she had the encouragement of all of these people. The Spirit comes alongside of us, calls to us, you've got this, stay the course, it's going to be okay. That's one image associated here. The other image would be maybe a little bit more tender. If you're in a place of grief, if you've just received bad news, and you think to yourself, how in the world can I face tomorrow? How in the world is this going to happen? It's the image of a good friend coming alongside you, putting their arm around you, praying with you, speaking to you. Hey, remember this. Hey, I'm here for you. Hey, it's going to be okay. See, what Jesus is saying to his disciples in this moment is that peace comes through presence. His presence and the way that God's presence is mediated in our lives is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't just simply come alongside you, Jesus says. The Holy Spirit is within you. You have the presence of God in you continually speaking to you, reminding you of things, encouraging you, comforting you. It's going to be okay. Keep going. I'm going to give you everything you need to face tomorrow. Stay the course. It's all going to be all right. So Jesus is saying that peace comes through presence. The other thing that Jesus is saying to his disciples is that peace is found in obedience. Verse 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. That's the second time Jesus has said that in this passage. The first time, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So Jesus says the Spirit is coming to mediate his presence to his followers. He will advocate for them. He will paracoleto them. He will come alongside them and communicate and encourage them. The other way that the Spirit is described in this passage is that it's said to be the Spirit of truth in verse 17. It says, the advocate will, will come to help you, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Those two titles will get used again in chapter 15, verse 26 side by side. This is a two ways that Jesus is describing who the Spirit is. He is the advocate and he is the Spirit of truth. And the other thing Jesus says the Spirit will do in our lives is teach us and remind us of everything Jesus taught. If we were to jump ahead to verse 26, this is what we see. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Essentially, seemingly, with the intention that we will do what the Spirit says for us to do, that we will follow the teaching of Jesus, and we will live faithful to what he has put 
in front of us. Uh, one of the things that I started to do this fall to begin my week is to start the first few hours of Monday at home, specifically to have uninterrupted study time. Uh, usually when I come into the office on Mondays, uh, it's not uncommon for just everybody coming in to talk about the weekend. Did you see the Packers game? What did you do? How was this? And next thing you know, it's like noon, and I haven't even thought at all about what I'm going to do the following weekend teaching-wise. So it's really good for me to spend the first few hours of my week just getting my head around where am I going sermon-wise, what am I teaching here, how is this all going to come together. So a few weeks back, I start my Monday that way. I'm sitting at home, I study for a couple hours, and I think to myself, um, I should go on a walk because I've read a lot, I've thought a lot, and if I go on a walk through my neighborhood, it will let all of these thoughts and ideas settle in my head and my heart, and I'll begin to have some clarity around what I'm going to teach. So this is a picture of my neighborhood. The star on that map is our house, and so I go on this walk, I leave my house, and I start to go south till I hit this intersection just, you know, a half a block away from my house. My original plan was to take a left at that intersection and go east to this other intersection, turn, make a right, and go south, and then take a big loop, about a two-mile loop through our neighborhood to walk for an hour or so and just let all of these things settle in. So I go to this intersection. I'm going south on my street. I make that initial left. I start to go east, and then I just stop because I look up and I look ahead, and my neighbor is in his front yard doing yard work. And I think to myself, do I really want to pass my neighbor? I mean, the last interaction I had with him was a little awkward. It was a little weird. It was a little uneasy. And if I walk by him, am I going to get sucked into another awkward conversation? Am I going to get distracted in what I'm doing? And what I'm doing here is really spiritual stuff, really <laughs> spiritual things. Like I'm going on a walk to be with the Lord, to communicate with him about what I should communicate to Meadowbrook Church. I can't be bothered by an awkward conversation with my neighbor. So I just stop, and I see all that, and this is all within a matter of a few seconds. I just do a real quick U-turn. I go back, and I keep going south down my street, and I do my two-mile loop in a different way. So I do my two-mile loop, and now I'm coming back towards my house. I'm about a block away or so of making the turn to go back to my house, and I see my neighbor is still in his front yard doing work, and that's when the spirit is like all over me. Like, Brian, why are you trying to avoid people? Like, Brian, I've called you, and you say this to your church all the time, that we should be for the people. We should bear witness to our neighbors, those who live right next door. And here you are trying to avoid your neighbor when all you have to do is walk up to them. I'm not asking you to spend all day with them. Just go check in, see how they're doing. Have a conversation. Ask a few questions. Just be present with them in the same way that I'm present with you. The Spirit was all over me to just go and engage for a few minutes with my neighbor. Jesus says the Spirit will be with you. He will come alongside to encourage you, to comfort you, but also to teach you and remind you of everything that Jesus taught the disciples and to remind you of the commands that Jesus has given and called us to live into. And if the Spirit's job is to remind us of all that Jesus taught, Jesus made it really easy for the Holy Spirit. Because in the Old Testament, there are 613 commands. That's a lot of commands. Jesus summarizes it with two. He says, all of the law, all of the prophets, the entire Old Testament hinges on these two things. Love God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. On that walk, the Spirit is simply teaching me, reminding me, prompting me, go be the love of Jesus to the neighborhood in which you live. Kind of insinuating that as we walk in obedience to Jesus, we bear witness to who he is to the world around us. Because in this teaching moment, Jesus gets interrupted by one of the disciples. This is verse 22. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, that's the one who betrayed Jesus. This is a different Judas. He said, but Lord, why do you intend to show uh, yourself to us and not the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, insinuating that our obedience is one way that we bear witness to the truth 
of who God is. You could say it this way, that the result of obedience is God's love flowing to you, ultimately so that it can flow through you. Because what Jesus is saying here is that peace comes through obedience. He says that, that peace is found in presence. It comes through obedience, and it's also experienced in love. Repeatedly, Jesus says that those who walk in obedience demonstrate their love for me. And when they do, we come to them and abide in them. That's what Jesus says in verse 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And then my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. It seems to all come together in verse 23 that peace is found in God's presence and his love as we walk in obedience. Now, this raises a couple questions. If you've been tracking with this, if you've been paying attention to what Jesus says, it raises a couple of questions because in some ways it kind of sounds like Jesus' peace is conditional. Like he's not really just freely giving peace to anybody, but it's conditional based on how we live. Because is he really seeking to just give peace or only to those who walk in obedience? And does his obedience really bring peace? Because it also kind of sounds like an obligation. Like, I have to do this thing in order for Jesus to be with me and then ultimately to love me. Which of these things comes first? Now, if you go back to my example of, like, my neck at the beginning, right? And I'm in, like, I find out in October I got this bump on my neck. I don't get in to get an ultrasound until December, and i got to wait till March until I get the results read. And it's somewhere in January. And let's say I'm sitting in my couch. I have this picture that we showed earlier. And, I, and I'm in one of those places of distress. And I'm in one of those places of like worst case scenario. I'm just got, this thing has spread and I'm going to die. Like if a friend comes alongside me in that moment and says to me, well, Brian, sitting, to me in a place like, sitting with me in a place like that, you know what you need to do. All you need to do is go obey. Just obey, obey, obey. Then God will come to you, and then he will love you, and then he will tell you everything's going to be okay. Like, is that what Jesus is saying? Because truthfully, that doesn't sound like peace to me. That sounds like duty. It sounds like obligation. It, it sounds like I have to perform for God in order to to get his love and acceptance and peace, almost as though if I obey, then I will be accepted. I, I obey to be accepted and loved and receive peace from Jesus, but that doesn't sound like peace. That sounds like my obedience somehow manipulates God to give me something. And it raises the question like, well, how much? How much obedience is enough in order to get God to love me, to respond to me, and ultimately accept me? It kind of feels like uh, when I was in grad school, I went to grad school in the Chicago area, and the school I attended and where I lived was north of the city. There's one day I was downtown visiting a friend, and I was coming up 94 to go back to my apartment. And, and this was before um, there was like the open toll roads where you could just drive through, and this was before easy passes and I passes became a mainstay, and you had all of these toll booths that had that arm across, and you had to drop change in, and you had to drop enough change in to get the arm to go up. Well, one day it was like 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday night, I'm coming back to my apartment, and I drive up to the toll booth, kind of blocked in by concrete blocks on the side, and I got this arm in front of me, and I look down because I've got this change cup. I take change with me everywhere I go, and I have no quarters. I'm starting to like dig around in the change. I've got no dimes. I've got no nickels. Like all I have is pennies. And it's like a dollar or something for that arm to go up. And I'm like, what do I do? Cars are starting to back up behind me. It's not like I can just do a U-turn on the interstate and go another direction. And I'm like, what do I do? Like the angst starts to rise. Like, do I have enough? Is there enough in this cup to actually get me through? So I just start taking handfuls of change, handfuls of pennies, and just dumping them in, praying the whole time, like, please, Lord, let there be enough pennies in this cup 
to open up the arm. And like, I emptied my cup. Like, I just put them all in there. And you heard it counting like, and then it just stops. And then there's a moment of pause. And then it eventually goes, ding, green light. I'm like, oh, thank the Lord. Like, I'm not going to have to spend the night on the interstate. Okay, I'm going to make it. But sometimes it feels like when we talk about obedience and following Jesus, that we obey so that God will accept us. And there's this angst, well, have I obeyed enough? Have I done enough? Have I proven myself enough to God so that he will open the gate, let me in, and then finally give the peace that I long for? Sometimes we view obedience in that light. But what if obedience isn't an act that manipulates or controls God to get us in or give us what we want, but obedience is being the person that God created you to be. That we were called and created to be in relationship with God. That's what He desires. We're created in His image to be in relationship with Him so that we can operate in partnership with Him in loving people and stewarding and caring for the world. And when we start to see obedience in that light, that obedience is actually rooted in relationship, it's not a way that we do stuff to try and get God to be happy with us and appease Him so He gives us what we want, but we rest in relationship with Him. This relationship that He offers freely says, come, come be with me. Come follow me. Come order your life around the way that I have created it to be, and you will experience peace. What Jesus is trying to say to his disciples here is that peace is found in relationship with Jesus. That when we rest in our relationship with Jesus, it brings us peace. And and notice what he says in verse 27. He, He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. See, oftentimes, the world gives peace based on our performance. Meaning the world expects us to live a certain way, to behave a certain way, to obey, to perform. And if you do these things, if you perform this way, essentially, if you obey, the world will accept us and love us. But what Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples, not just in this moment, but all throughout this evening meal, he's saying you're already accepted. Like you're already loved. Therefore, rest in my love and go communicate that to others. That's what happens at the beginning of chapter 13. We, the reader, are told that Jesus knows. He knows it's time for him to leave this world. He knows it's time for him to go back to the Father. And it says that he loved those who were in the world, and he loved those who were his own, and he loved them to the end. Jesus is trying to demonstrate for the disciples, you are already loved. He does it just before this passage through getting low and washing their feet and getting close to them and saying to them, you are clean. Not because of what you've done, but just simply because I love you and you are mine. See, when you see that obedience is resting in God's love, resting in that relationship, trusting that that His peace comes to you, then it has the power to flow through you to the world around you. Jesus is saying, rest in my peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. The world gives peace based on performance. I give it just because you're mine, just because I love you. And what we have before us is the Lord's Supper. This simple meal that is given to us to remind us of just how much God loves us. It says that the Spirit's job is to come alongside you, to communicate comfort and encouragement, but also to teach and remind you. One of the things the Spirit does through this meal is reminds us of what God has done, the great lengths to which he has gone to show and demonstrate his love, not just in washing of the disciples' feet in the previous chapter, but all of that is a pointer to the cross. Laying his life down 
for the sake of his disciples, to make a way for us to be restored to relationship with him and to walk into the life that he created us to live, one of relationship with God, partnership with him, and living, into the wor- living out in the world in a way that communicates and demonstrates all that. We, we sang earlier this morning that, that we know how the story ends, right? That sometimes our life gets disrupted, sometimes angst is high, we feel like we lack peace, but we know how the story ends. The Spirit comes to remind us the good news of Jesus' death for us, His presence with us, and His empowerment in and through us to live the life we're called to live in the here and now, knowing it's all going somewhere. It's going on the direction of there will come a day when Jesus comes back to make everything right. And so, in the here and now, we have peace because we have relationship with God. We have peace because His presence is dwelling within us. And we have peace because there's hope for where this whole thing is headed. And this meal is a reminder of all those things. It's a reminder of God's love. It's a reminder of His presence with you. It's a reminder of there will come a day when all angst that we experience will be gone because all will be made right. And so we as people wait and hope for that day, trusting that God is with us in the here and now. So therefore, we have the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. So the way that we're going to finish our time together, we're going to go before the Lord's table. This meal, again, stands as a reminder of who God is, what He has done for us, and how He's calling us to live. So in just a moment, our ushers will come forward. They will dismiss you row by row. I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team to come back up. They're going to play um, some music as we come before the Lord's table. The invitation is, once you're dismissed, to come up the middle aisle. You can go to one of these four tables. We invite you to come to the two that are on the side of the room you're on. All the elements in these tables are the same. If you're taking elements from the silver dishes, you're going to want to take two cups. There's bread in the bottom cup, juice on the top cup. If you need a gluten-free option, there's those in the prepackaged uh, bowls of, of, of elements right there. And then we're going to invite you to take, go back to your seat through the side aisle. Once everyone has returned to their seat, I'll come up and lead us in taking the elements together. If you need help um, getting some, just ask a neighbor, ask an usher, and we'll make sure we get elements to you. But as we go before this table, uh, the reminder is that God is with us. He's for us. He has reconciled us to Him. He's making all things new. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for what this meal represents. We thank you so much for your faithfulness in our lives. We ask, Lord, that in this moment we would have awareness to the fact that you're with us, you're for us, and that we would have eyes to see, hearts that are open, and a willingness to follow wherever you send. So thank you, Lord, for all you have done. We ask this in your name. Amen.